Hello and welcome to On Landscape. We're continuing our Capture One tutorials in the same vein as we ran our original Lightroom tutorials with a, uh, a look at some of the basic importing tools based on a trip that Joe recently took to Egg. Is that right, Joe? That's right, Tim. Thank you. Good to be back. Excellent. Uh, and you had some fun time on Egg, I think. It was where the beast from the east came in. So no snow on Egg, sadly. No snow on egg. Um, I mean, the the only only regret I have about doing this is is sharing how what, what a fantastic place egg is because you can imagine it getting very popular. But having said that, most I think most on landscape uh, viewers will be familiar with it. I think so. Yes. Yes. And what time of year was this when you were out there? So it's February. Oh, you might not think the ideal time to go to uh, an island uh, off the west coast of Scotland, but it was dry all week, and uh, we had marvellous conditions really so yeah. yeah it was a real treat like i said it was the, the beast from the east so the the england and the east coast and central belt of scotland were deep in snow i got stuck in london couldn't get transport <laughs> back um but it all, all all dumped on the cairngorm so by the time it got out of here you had some reasonable weather i think there was very little uh, of anything other than well sunlight and cloud i mean we were lovely soft light a lot of the time which is great but it's also bitterly cold um, as you can see from one or two of these images, Excellent. Uh, and and that was great. Uh, the egg itself, uh, the the side of the island that that most people will, will visit, is sheltered from the easterly wind. It's still windy, but not uh, anything like as bad as it might have been otherwise. So what we're, we're going to look at today, we, we last issue we uh, did a quick overview of some of the tools available, mm. how you can work. Just introductory this time. Um, you use a basic untitled session and browse the image, browse your local hard drive to find images. Is that correct? I'm, I've, you know, I'm the uh, typical bearer of very little brain here. So I, I just take the simplest approach I possibly can. I don't like to do, uh, I've, I've always found with Lightroom, that I think gets me confused is the whole kind of import export side of it. And um, so I, I'm, we're talking about Capture One here. And one of the great things about Capture One is you don't have to do an import at all. Um, you can literally just browse your computer. So I have an untitled session. Uh, you have to have something, uh, a sort of superstructure. And underneath the untitled session, you can just look for anything you know, on your on your computer, on your hard drive or on an external drive or whatever it might be. So if we look here in the library module of uh, Capture One, you can see system folders um, and then the usual hierarchy. And uh, so in uh, my case, I'm down at my pictures folder level. And in there, I've just got a few um, few set, a, a, a few folders with, with images in it from the last two or three uh, months. Excellent. Um... So talk us through what your typical process is when you are bringing images in or checking images to work on. Absolutely. Well, the as you can see from the left-hand side, which is the browser column uh, in Capture One, uh, there's only six images visible, and that's because they've gone through a filter that we've we pre-selected. But just to illustrate how that works, here you can see the filter uh, aspect of the, of the software. Uh, if we click None, that means that all images appear right, yes. counterintuitively um, because there's none in the sense there's no filter. I haven't used stars or colors or anything else. I prefer to use colors than stars um, just because I find it a little bit easier to see them. Um, and, and because I, I don't, I don't know, I just don't select on the basis of a hierarchy. I select on the basis of do I want to work on the picture yeah. or not? Yeah. Um, and so in the case of uh, of, of this, it was a pretty productive week, and I've actually selected nearly 40 pictures to work on. However, we don't want to be working our way through all of those uh, today. So you've done you've done your initial processing on a lot of these already. But what we've done is we've taken a, a, a variant they call them in uh, Capture One uh, of the of the ones we want to work on, and then we've reset them. Uh, and when you make the variant, they automatically get reset anyway. That's right. So it's very kind of you because I, otherwise I'd have had to reset all that hard work that yes. I've done on these on some of the images edited here. Whereas the nice thing about this is that we can go up to image and you can see with two options uh, with variants. You can choose a new variant or a clone variant. A new variant is 
a new raw. It, basically, it's the same raw file. It's just showing you a new symbol as or if icon it, it, as if you'd re-imported it with no adjustments made. If you if you choose a clone variant, it will just duplicate the image at the state that it re had reached already in editing terms. So, so if we so, go to those six images that we've chosen, what we've done is... Uh, we filtered them with a green tab. Yes. There. So yes, so straight away, we, we're looking just, if we just quickly run through these, uh, these are raw files in their raw state. Uh, three of them, uh, four other uh, capture one uh, file, sorry, uh, phase one, 100 megapixel files. And these two are Sony A7R2 uh, files at uh, 42 megapixels so um, they're all uh, they're, they, they're very characteristic of raw files although I think it's worth saying that early doors let's have a look at, um, at first of all I think probably the very first thing we should look at is underneath the color the color symbol tab here which just shows the base characteristics of the file now, it should be pointed out you made a few changes to way, the way the menus are because it's very configurable, as we mentioned last time. Yes, um, correct. But, um, and, and anybody can do that. You could, there are Lightroom settings that make it look more like Lightroom, as we discussed. Yes. Uh, so if you if you can't see any of these items we're looking at in the, the right columns, you probably will in this one, um, they will be available elsewhere, or, otherwise you can add them yourselves. Uh, using the top menu item, I think. You can do it that way, or you can even just go uh, yeah, right click can. or control click and add tool, and it gives you the list. So that's how I usually do it. Yeah. Um, we're going to leave it on this occasion. But we're looking at the base characteristics. Yes, and most of these are, if you if you were to require Capture One, you'll see that it comes with, uh, with a, a sort of menu, what, what a phase regard as the kind of most logical way to work in, in practice. Most people will want to create their own uh, their own menu, yes. and that's the beauty of it. So underneath the color tab here, uh, we can see there's a histogram and then base characteristics, and this has got the profile. It will automatically, of course, read the with the camera file yeah. um, and select the uh, the ICC profile that's recommended for that. And it's got settings for all the cameras built in. It does, it does, and in the case of phase one, it it, it gives you for each different back. Uh, there's tungsten portrait outdoor daylight and so on and for whatever reason it always chooses flash which is fine because it's virtually identical to outdoor daylight which yeah. I'm going to put in there just to yeah. prove the point um, it also has what's a, a curve characteristic which is on auto but you can let me just show you briefly linear response for example gives uh, the flattest un most uninflected uh, of, of all um, raw data that can be useful if you've got uh, quite an overexposed file. If you're exposing to the right on a, on yeah. a, on a non-contrast image, for instance. Yeah, but it's quite hard work then to bring that back uh, to, to look good. It looks really flat and really dead. Yeah. A, a film standard there, linear scientific, I'm not quite sure how that differs. But it's a little like the similar to the linear one. Yeah, um, yeah. film extra shadow, that does what it says on the tin, and film high contrast, which is a... A lot of people will like that because it takes you quickly down a road of looking quite punchy for landscapes, but I don't personally use that. Yeah. Or auto, which is a, a good balance um, and frankly works well as a starting point in yeah. most cases. So if you never touch it and leave it on auto, that's usually fine. Um, okay, so the, the next thing I would suggest is we go back to the lens characteristics here. So this is lens or the lens correction tab. Yeah. And it starts with a, a lens correction, um, the usual lens correction adjustments that can be made. Um, and they're usually unticked apart from hide distorted areas, although I'm never quite sure what that really means. I think that's if the if the profile, lens profile is applied any uh, okay. barrel or, barrel uh, or pin, cushion, pin distortion. cushion distortion, it will hide the funny edges. Understood. Okay, well, since it's in its generic form, it probably doesn't have anything at the moment. Um, I'm pretty sure this picture was made with a 40 millimeter Rodenstock digger on, so I can actually choose that particular lens by going to Rodenstock and 40 millimeter here, and it's immediately applied chromatic aberration. Yeah. Uh, specific to that lens, um, probably doesn't. It's not desperate with a picture like this, but just as a matter of interest, if we looked in this corner 
here where we might possibly see it. Yeah. And we then turn it off. No surprises with a Roman stock digger on. There you isn't can't much actually see it. Yeah. <laughs> no, okay, fair enough. But anyway, that's yeah. that's the um, that's what it, it, it does, and it does a very good job generally, like as Lightroom does. We'll probably see that better on the Sony images. I, I think so. Later on. Yeah, um, and and especially maybe a little icy one. Uh, it has a purple fringing thing. We don't have any problems with this image there. Um, it also has a lens cast calibration applied, and I'm not going to go into this. No, we'll come back now, to that in a, in a later a future thing. edition. Uh, so that's good. Uh, and then we can see from this module most of these little controls are I mean, rotation and flip speaks for itself, um, and you can change the angle here, of course, and double click takes you back to zero um, you can do this yeah nine and, degrees good for your um, yeah. previewing upside down that's right but you can also do that up here by oh, that. okay yeah so which is um you know so always good there um and yes so same thing with the pen yeah. yeah um crop speaks for itself again uh, i actually always use this tool up here though uh, and when that's applied if it's in unconstrained form you can just drag from the edges so ordinarily you would be in unconstrained and uh, let's just see what a preset crop looks like. So we'll go to square and now you should be able to click and drag and and then position it accordingly with what is the default navigator appears within the crop tool. So yeah. um, and I wouldn't actually want to do that, but um, with this picture, but you can see it works quite nicely and easily. Now, did you put the presets into those crop? Um, settings the the sixteen to nines and the five sevens or are they no, built in? They're all there. They're yeah. all built in. Yeah. Go back to unconstrained. Go back to this symbol here, um, and we can just either drag it out or we could go back in uh, the history. Doesn't matter. Uh, so always different ways of doing it. We have a keystone tool, but that's not relevant probably for this example. So we should look at that. Later. No, we'll have an example for that later, definitely. And then vignetting uh, very much it does what it says on the tin. What did I do? I just hit a preset. Here we are. Sorry, hit a keystoning thing. Um, so vignetting, uh, well, you probably wouldn't go that way, but you can see that's yeah. how it works. Um, go this way, you might definitely do in landscape photography, um, depending what your interpretation of the image was going to be. So for now, we'll leave it neutral, but I will come back to that. Okay. And spot removal. Rather like Lightroom, it's not a perfect solution. Yeah. Um, but for, Good for the occasional obvious one. spots, it's it's fine. And um, let's see if I can find one here. Um, I'm pleased to say that the sensor looked as if it was quite clean on this occasion. So we'll take that back. And by the way, double clicking um, with mouse uh, takes you to 100%. With yeah. um, so it has quite a different sort of interactive sizing compared with with Lightroom so the image size can be changed with a uh, two finger swipe on a Mac okay like this so you can go that's 33 percent you keep pushing 50 67 and up to 100 and you go all the way to 400 if you want um, and uh, it can sometimes be useful for for troubleshooting and um, double finger swipe takes you back to zero it's very very quick to use once you get the hang of it so that's nice Okay, so um, at this stage, I wouldn't wish, I don't think, with a possible exception of applying a little bit of, maybe a little bit of basic vignetting, just to darken the corners a bit, uh, want to do very much in this module other than the chromatic aberration, which we've done. So uh, now these tabs here, that's the color tab, and most of the characteristics under there are relevant to color character. Uh, including a black and white module here, which will be familiar to many through Photoshop yes. and Lightroom. Yeah. Uh, and, and like those bits of software, it, it has quite a lot of control and see a lot of change there with the red. But I'm pretty sure that if we use the blue, yeah. um, oh, interesting. It doesn't do as much as you might think, but yes, it does change. Actually, that's quite interesting. It gives a lot more texture to the Isle of Rum in the distance. Cutting through the haze. Yeah. Um, so let's just double click on that and we can see it does exactly that as you say um, cuts the haze not something you necessarily want but you can see how that could be really useful if you're a monochrome or you have a monochrome solution in mind uh, for for this image personally I think that that the color is or will be a really significant part of, of it and 
the fundamental white balance is the first thing that we want to look at. Yes. So the white balance tab is here. Uh, and uh, the process I usually like to use uh, to get myself into the right area, in fact, is something I'm going to shift, by the way. So forgive me for doing this. I'm going to go straight to the layers column, which I tend to use as my default editing column. Yeah. And the reason for that is I have the key characteristics that I want already set up in this column. And I have white balance immediately below. So uh, this is a menu that you've set up. It is, yeah. yes. So m while uh, these ones I've left pretty much as is, underneath this little magnifier tool, or sometimes called the layers column, uh, I have had a uh, configured, as it were, to my own taste. Yeah. Um, and just to give you an idea, how do you do that? Well, let's say you wanted the white balance a little bit further down, you could take it down and just leave it, say, there. But no, I prefer to have it there. So that's, that's how it works. Yes. Very easy to use. Saturation. I wouldn't ordinarily ever do this, but in order to quickly arrive at a better color balance, I've pushed the saturation really hard and I tried to reduce the casts. And the casts are those colors that exist away from So the, you're using the saturation tool as a, as a forensic tool almost it's a to quick, be able to it's exactly easily right. see casts. It just makes it quicker. Yeah. You don't have to do this, but it's just easier to see them. And I know from experience, a lot of people find this immensely helpful from doing workshops. So the Kelvin slider, let's remind ourselves, goes from blue to yellow. Um, and somewhere in the middle there, we'll be able to, and I, the way I like to think of it is you're looking for both casts and it's a balance, a tolerable. A, it's like it's like the brain is working to sort of what feels right yeah. in terms of the amount of blue and yellow. Now, in the end, you're probably going to say, well, actually, I, I, I have a cold feeling or a warm feeling about this image, and that's that's where your taste is going to take you. Yes. But at this stage, just for balance, let's just take it to what you might call an equal blue, equal yellow kind of mix. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not going to be too precise, but that's good enough for now. And the same applies with the tint slider, which takes us from green to magenta. And interestingly, I always think it's worth remembering, you know, we think of blue, yellow, Blue is cold, yellow is warm. We all know that, we all accept it and, and expect it. The, there is also a warm, cool aspect to tint and it's counterintuitive, which is that green is actually warm. Yeah. And uh, it's, a, it's a, a more refined kind of uh, interpretation, but magenta is cold. Green being yeah. very close to yellow, essentially. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And, and actually magenta is more like blue in a way. So even though magenta is a red, it has this cooling characteristic. So, um, and really what we'd like to do here um, is is lose the magenta and the green. So it just disappears, which we've pretty much done. Yep. Now, magic moment, double click saturation. And boy, does that look flat. Neutral image, yes. Not only that, it looks desaturated. There's, there's not much color in there, yes. And, it, and I can promise you, I mean, you could say, well, is that what it looked like? No, it, it honestly didn't look like that. And I think that's because raw files fundamentally, the way, is this to do with the way that they're engineered? Is it to, way that, is it to do with the way that the software is set up? I'm not sure. But um, the, the fact is, is it applies in Lightroom as well with landscape photography it's normal to need a little bit of saturation to make them look normal otherwise they will look unsaturated mm. now you can either go straight to okay well let's take it to sort of i don't know 30 points of saturation or so which is certainly looks quite natural to me or you could target specific colors straight away and say well I, actually what i want to do is to, i want to push the red forward or mm. the <laughs> or the yellows and blues. And we, and we have, a, as, as a viewer of an image, we have a, uh, a different tolerance for saturation in different colours. Some colours we, we see as a, um, looking incorrect when they're saturated. Yeah. Other colours we can tolerate quite a lot of saturation in. I've certainly found that to be the case, but also is it not also the case that most people um, have their own tolerances? Yeah. Because I, I, I find that I've, I will sit down with somebody who has different colour vision and, and, and they find it, you know, Jenny, for example, my my partner, she she has a very very high sensitivity to green. Yes, and she's always saying, "Take that green out of it." Which, yeah. and I found generally it's very effective. Actually, what she always says. I mean, what one thing that 
um, I'd like to point out right away is that uh, in this image, my and this is immediately now we've we've looked at, at a basic balance. I'm reasonably happy with that as a starting point. Uh, but my first impression is um, well, there's several impressions, but one is that this wonderful wave here just on that verge of breaking this is the moment oh look at that yeah they're riding on top of it oh. see that's one of the nice things about photography isn't it yeah. you find all sorts of things that yeah that's not a toy boat by the way that's, no. um, <laughs> that's actually a military um it does look like that, boat it? yeah back in um just doing a little patrol i don't think i even remember that from the time what an admission that's it. all supposed to be about observation, isn't it, as a photographer too? There we are. Um, what I was thinking, though, was that the colour, the richness of the breaking wave was something that had this big effect on my imagination at the time. And the colour is sort of rather lost there, isn't it? Yeah, dark and, um, and muted. Yeah, rather muted. So that's some, one of the things that I'd like to, to look at to adjust, to sort of bring it out in some way. Um, the other things are uh, this sunny... or sunny highlight it is in fact a highlight of the sun now the sun is behind cloud yeah but it's only just so it's a and that that luminous luminance is, is a big part for me of what made the image attractive i have to admit that this picture is a bit of a personal i was going to say trope it might be the wrong word but it is a um it's a kind of signature sort of style thing yes and it, it's a little bit tongue-in-cheek because i I've, i got slightly fed up with being um <laughs> having that that sort of big boulder in the foreground thing stamped yeah. on my forehead but um but nevertheless i love the the roundness of the of these stones here and and so uh the way that uh, the light describes it as being very spherical is through light and shade of course so that the highlight's very important and the um and that uh, i think could be emphasized um, it's looking almost like a, a mirror glow because you can see the, the the cliffs behind you at the bottom right hand side of it. Yeah, it is a it step. is indeed uh, a s spherical mirror. Yeah, uh, quite right. But like a car is a car shaped mirror. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, if you look at rum in the background, we can see there is color there. Um, from a distance, it might look quite flat, but there there are colors. And if we wanted to create more spatial separation we could try to separate those colours out a bit more. So those are the things I'm thinking of predominantly. And then the other, uh, correct me if I'm doing this too quickly or um, this doesn't make sense, but if, if we think that colour balance uh, or the white balance is fundamental and we've cleared that up, then we're pretty early, or early on into an interpretation. Yes, personal interpretation. I think so, yes. Okay, so my first step then is this turn it upside down and um, again uh, anyone who's ever worked with me knows that's a fairly characteristic standard practice done by painters and um, and, and I learned this trick from Eddie you know, my Eddie Ephraim's great friend uh, in the dark room yeah nearly 40 years ago I think we could say it goes all the way back to the Claude glass it, in romantic period as well it, although I was flipping the image left yeah. to right and distorting it Spot but it's on. effectively the same a absolutely yeah. abstraction of the image abstraction of the image you, and you, you can you then appreciate it for its formal qualities its abstract qualities uh, let's say um, and I'd like to think looking at it, it it's pretty well balanced but the one thing that jumps out at me and the other thing I like to do is, is vary the sizing a bit and it's nice to work with a bit of white space so yes. the image it helps to uh, get it away from the and you um, can you can see structure a lot more clearly when an image is smaller as well broad structural strokes yes you you can yeah spot on you can make it smaller and capture one by the way by going it, it's not quite as convenient as lighter than that but you can do this by going to preferences and appearance and changing the proof margin like this okay yeah so that's so, your white space around the outside yes. of the image the, the trouble is what would be really nice to have is to have appearance uh, maybe I should ask Catcher One as part of a menu item. yes yeah, yeah. So, that would be nice wouldn't it to, yes. rather than having to go into the top menu to do it they need a nudge so anyway that's um, that's fine for now yeah um, so uh, but the bright bright sky at the top is, is something that's a bit eye catching it's not yes. terrible or uh, desperately bad but um if we if we thinking of the environmentalists view of the world at 
local think global so we're thinking global we're thinking about the overall qualities but in order to make the global work better we have to make a local adjustment and i'm going to do that by going to my layers palette and this is where photoshop users will be pleased with the way that capture one is laid out because um the pr the workflow is to hit the plus uh which uh, symbol which gives you a new layer it's an empty layer when an it empty changes. layer it's an adjustment layer though and then you can you can either draw or or inscribe uh however you wish to do it uh you can either actually the way you, i've got a a gradient tool up here at the moment you can use a draw mask or the gradient tool i think gradient's probably quite good actually for here um and well, this is this is probably one of the places where capture one differs from lightroom and photoshop the most in the in the way the layer is built up isn't it it, it is yeah I, I agreed so what i'm going to do is and i'm still upside down so forgive me for that but i'm going to go there and draw and this is quite like photoshop less like lightroom um in that we can, and we can draw and just keep redrawing it until we're happy with the look of the mask. Yeah. So the red mask you saw briefly when I drew is where the adjustment will be. And then we can use any of these tools. So let's say brightness. Well, I'm not going to use that much, obviously, but yeah. you know that's that's what's happening. Now, it is a bit too bright, but we could also say, well, actually, it's really the highlight that's the, that's the problem. So why don't we use the highlight slider in the high dynamic range? And that creates quite a... A nicely controlled and it doesn't have to look dark it just has to look less eye-catching yeah you could even actually take the contrast down a little bit and that would tend to in fact i've taken it down rather a lot but that will tend to make it look less eye-catching as well because wherever there's high contrast the eye tends to go and if you have high contrast right at the edge of the frame like that it is a bit Perhaps a bit more than you want. It takes you out of the edge of the picture. Well, the Another idea thing. of that's not happening. Yeah, and you could easily also reduce saturation a little bit. Okay, we go too far, it looks dead. But just by taking a little saturation out, we can let the, the again, the eye just tends to wander more easily into the frame. So that's that's the idea. Can we switch that layer off and on just to see sure. the effect? And well, let's zoom in a also bit. go to full frame yeah. and do this. Um, as you say, and we're going to just drag it up and see what the effect of that is so turn it off and on yeah it's balanced it with the rest of the sky it's so closer it's yeah time, yes. yeah and i mean in fact in some ways you could say it, it's brought it has brought more, more texture which on the one hand seems more might seem more eye-catching but because it's not so bright it's not having that that slightly irritant effect that, that the brightness creates a very high brightness so still got the image upside down let's reduce in size again a little bit and it doesn't really need that much doing to it i don't think um i think it's more uh, i mean the text is i love the softness of the water and so i'm not inclined to say increase clarity which is one thing see one one might think of doing however i would like to increase saturation just in here now you could say well do you target that color well yes maybe but what I don't want to do is to get involved in having a very complicated little selection around here. Instead, what I'd rather do is simply use what I regard as, as a kind of, uh, it's light guided. Um, it, it's kind of drawing with light, painting with light, if you prefer. Here's my paintbrush. And you can see that the inner circle here is 100%. The outer circle is the edge of the feather so yeah. that in theory is a feathered zone in practice it's very very it's a bit more focused than that really but let's just take this area very important area and rather than increasing contrast or clarity i just want to increase saturation now i could either do that generically like that which probably works fine or if i wanted to be really really focused about it i could take the color editor so the color editor can also be used locally and take a little that's a sample yes. of that color you can see it selected it there and you can see it's also quite low saturation because it's not pushed out to the edge of the color wheel this is the typical color wheel saturated on the outside unsaturated in the center with a hue going around like a clock yes and i'm going to increase the smoothness and that just slightly increases the selection area 
and now increases saturation. If I go mad, you'll see that it goes horrible. You can see the selection there. Though. Yeah, but you can see where it's affected, pulling it back, pulling it back, pulling it back, and probably somewhere like that is not too bad. You know, it's just just puts a bit more emphasis in that area. Now you could say, well, couldn't you use that elsewhere? Yeah, you could, and you could paint it in yeah. elsewhere later. Um, so and, uh, let me just prove that point. If we take the brush and, and let's say, what about this here? Some nice reflected color there. If we just paint in very 100%, very yeah. crudely, then it should lift that color a little bit more in there. And what you might actually want to do is to just reduce the color in there because that's slightly dragging yeah. the eye to the edge. And if I were to do that, I would add another layer. And this time we'll just use a little bit of desaturation generically because it's not a specific color but all colors and just draw in there and it what that will do is just well let's go mad and take it to black and white in fact it works um, but we'll pull it back to about half that so this is interesting because you've done you've used layers in two ways there one one you've drawn the mask first and then made the, the change Yes. On the second one, you made the change first. And then drew, and the, then mask. drew the mask afterwards. I mean, am I a naughty boy? No, no it's just, I like the flexibility of being able to choose between <laughs> the two. I, I've always tended to mix and match, uh, uh, depending on how I feel. Uh, I personally think one of the nice things about, uh, about this process, it's an artistic process. It's one where the decision making should be allowed to flow. Yeah. And so it's however you feel at the time. And the great thing about it is there's no engineering plus or minus with it you can and i think it's true with lightroom as well you can you can do your selections first or you do your uh, let's say a starting adjustment there was a time in lightroom where if you'd applied no adjustment you couldn't apply any you uh, you, you you couldn't have, you had to apply something yeah i don't think that's any longer no. the case you you can you can draw or paint first and then apply your adjustment Okay, um, it, we're doing very subtle things here, so I'll just try to, to do something that's a little bit more extreme and actually more difficult, and that is to look at this area um, of the image where rum is and see if it might be possible to separate these colors. Now, this is a, so this is a cooler tone, the shadow at the back, and there's a little bit more warmth coming through here. And my thought is, is it possible to make that color a little bit warmer and that color a little bit cooler yes and they're quite close to one another they're very close so close that when you look from further back they start blending they yeah they're barely visible which is why we want to make the change it is and uh, and that's to create more spatial separation but i'd rather not do it with just using tonal contrast i'd like to like to do it with color so that the that these very soft characteristics of the flowing water are not overwhelmed or or made to look artificial by by bringing the background up too hard so what might be a way of doing that well one of the ways that can work uh, now one thing i'd like to do is rather than do it globally which might affect some other similar colors i'm going to initially just paint the area that i want to affect so i'm going to make a slightly smaller brush uh, i'll keep the flow at 100 percent and I'm just literally going to select in the island pretty much. It doesn't have to be terribly precise edge-wise. Um, so in fact, you could even use, there's a little, if we go right click, we can see that there's an auto mask facility. I'm not even sure it'll really work here, but sometimes if this does work, what it'll do is it, it will draw the, sorry, it's just gathering its loins up here. Um, it will see the edge, texture edge, and it won't go beyond it. Yeah. So, trying to pick similar colors yeah and tones exactly um, so that will probably work so that's good enough for now i think and i'm going to turn that auto mask off now because i really generally hate it it doesn't work for me okay so we're now in a layer and we're going to take our color editor in fact uh, we're going to make the image bigger because it's also by the way just while we're doing this we can go command b and get rid of the browser so we've got a bit more real estate to work with here now i think this is where capture one comes into its own we can make targeted color hue saturation and lightness changes in a layer which in lightroom you can only do that globally in in the image 
Yeah, it is. Um, it's very. That's true. You, you, at least as far as I'm aware, mm. there's. Uh, I don't see plans for them to do it anyway. So, so yes, this is an advantage. So we select the. Um, we're in the advanced color editor tab here, and we're going to try to find the warmest tone we can. Uh, in there uh, on ROM, and you can yeah, see it's selected it's like a red color. Yeah. And now I'm going to try and find the coldest shadow tone. And there, and see, great. So you can at least see we're ready. We can identify them as different. Now, I'm going to go back to the warm tone. Well, I say warm, it's actually still a coolish red because it's a magenta ish red. So the first thing I'm going to do is to try to change the hue. But to help me in that process, I'm going to push the saturation up. Again, forensically, so we can see yeah. what's going on more easily. Yeah. It has you can see that parts of it are, yep. are affecting. So I'm going to change the smoothness. I'm actually expand the smoothness, which I hope will means it will select a little bit more of the visible color. And I'm going to change the hue by going that's towards magenta by going towards yellow. Yes. So that's making basically we're trying to separate the colors out. Um, and I've learned that from from doing lab color. Yes. In Photoshop in the past. Now that might look like a lot, and um, is it going to work? I'm not sure yet. I'm probably at a very high saturation. Um, but if I go to lightness and lighten as well, will that give me any joy? Well, you can see what's happening actually. It's interesting. You can see that the selection is quite fine at the moment, still, it is, isn't it? So it, it might is. need expanding. It, it, I think it is. And we're going to expand into the magenta area. I don't think we'll probably find much color around that side. But what I don't want to do is to overlap with the blue. So it's still got a bit more scope. And obviously I'm using a very, very high saturation and that's causing horrible artifacting, which you don't want yet, but it's but still it's good, helpful good to tell where you are. from a forensic point of view. Exactly. So um, also when we make things lighter, we remove saturation. So we're going to bring the saturation, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon, the lightness back. And you can see immediately it brings a richness of, of color in there. Saturation is still up at plus 50. So we can probably come back a little bit from that. And now if we go to the blue tone here, and again, we'll increase the saturation. And we can see that's already probably quite a, a reasonable blue. Yeah. Um, far, far too saturated now. So we'll just take it back to zero. We could perhaps put in a little bit just to emphasize that blueness. And let's just see what happens if we move the lightness. That yeah, definitely doesn't there. work. So if anything, we'd want to go the other way, wouldn't well, we? A little go dark, it gives you a little that little contrast change as well. Yeah. So the idea of that, if we go to our layer and click it off and on, it's a subtle difference. It's just cut through that haze but a little bit. It has cut it, through yes. the haze a bit, but it's what we're trying to do is use colour rather than just tonal contrast. I've got the rich, rich, richer yellows and oranges. Yes. And here's another another thing that I could do. This is a bit of a... Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to work, but bear with me. We're still in that layer and I'm going to look at midtones and the color balance tool. And what I'm going to do is give myself an emphasis towards orange overall. So I'm really warming up. Warming right? the midtones slightly, yes. Yeah. And, and what this is going to do, I think, is allow me to then go back to the shadows and cool them down a bit more so that the so that we've warmed run up a bit. That's just off and on, yeah. off and on. Yeah. Um, and now go back to the color editor and the advanced color editing tool. We're still in blue and we can now increase saturation of that. And we can actually now enhance it that little bit further by increasing the saturation. And yeah, I don't think it'll need any hue, so hue change particularly. Um, although the hue might be a tiny bit different now. Hold on, let's just see. Yeah, I think it yeah, might have gone slightly magenta. Want, to go, the, want yeah. to go the other way, so we want to go back towards green a little bit, um, and 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 then. So here's the thing: if I've ended up overdoing it, I can now pull the opacity of the layer back like that. So now, having used the the concept, so from nothing to 100 percent it's quite subtle actually isn't it but you can yeah. you, you see how it, it does create a slightly stronger feeling of light 
I think. We'll probably get a better impression actually this time if we put it the right way around. And and then I may have to back it off a bit. So off. Oh, yeah, and I think it's a, some more warmer light in there. It is, yeah. It's a, probably a bit too strong. So I'll just maybe bring it back to around 80 odd percent, maybe a bit less. Um, so you can slightly over egg the effect in order to be able to see what you're doing and then turn it down in the layer as well. Shot from egg and over egg. Over egg. Fact. So, yes. Can't um, under egg egg. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, so it's it's quite a fun one to try. And, and here's a, another one uh, while we're working on our local adjustments. You see this color here. Um, if we take another layer and create a brush and just quickly whiz through that area of the image and take the color editor the advanced color editor and try to select actually try to select a green that's visible as green will it be let's take a slightly lighter tone of it um, and lighten and let's back off a little bit see how it looks yes that's working and a little bit of saturation might have to um, refine clean the mask a little yes, bit the, yes the mask a little bit because it's gone into the the whites quite a lot uh, but that was the that was where i was hoping to go with it really um, take a erase brush here which is quite an important one by the way you can set it up to show the mask at various different stages i like to just show the mask when i'm drawing yes uh, we can just i'm doing it very roughly but uh, we can see how we can take that out there and it probably isn't actually affecting uh, any color above it so now if we go off on yes open it up it has opened up it, you know maybe it's too much but anyway i'll I'll, uh, I'll come back to that one if necessary um okay so what else i'm, I'm not unhappy with it um as as it is at the moment but i still think that probably there's a little bit more color uh, that could be had from the foreground to create a little bit more intensity and um, I'm always a bit wary in this world of high saturation sliding going on not to overdo things but um, I do think that to create um, a stronger emotional connection color saturation is no doubt part of human vision yeah so and we've, we've talked about it before as being not so much the saturation side that we desire it's the color separation that we desire which is reflected in the uh, the light changes you've just made on the room absolutely and if we uh if we're doing it in a slightly more quick and simple way here we know that we've already adjusted the color balance in a way we find palatable um already so if we just take global saturation uh, this is now acting locally i should say because it's just in that foreground area but there we are, plus 23, off yeah. and on, off and on. Richer in the water. It's richer in the water. Is it real? It's still real to me. Uh, so I could definitely live with that. If I wanted to, I could. I'm not sure that this is right, but we'll just take the arrays um, brush and take the flow down a little bit and then just maybe back it off around the edges a little bit. I mean, that's just the same as vignetting, really. Um, so using a saturation vignette is it right? it's an anti-saturation yeah. vignette really yeah exactly um, and, and, and just one that's targeted um, doesn't need to be very much it's it, these subtle changes of feeling that you can just you know guide it as, as subtly as possible uh, in the direction that you want to go is in my view very helpful so um we're, we're getting there I, I i did think at one point do i need to bring out more shadow detail in the rocks um but i'm not sure that's really going to help i quite like that intensity yes. of, of color and tone that comes with the the darkness and i think the dark tones um create quite a nice contrasting slightly somber note compared with the sort of lightness and flow of the water so uh, while I, I would be happy to leave it at that. Um, we could have a very quick look at how the, the original was done. Yes. Um, but I, I'd say that was um, not far off being ready to make my initial print. Excellent. So uh, should we just very quickly then, uh, we'll go back to our... Uh, we're going to need 
the browser back and go to none and we can see here that the original is visible and if I go command click I can see them together get rid of the browser command B and take them together it's just interesting what happens when you have time away from things you come back to it try it differently but you can see that my original interpretation is actually um, quite considerably colder yes so I must have had maybe a different view of of the world at that moment so you can see I've lightened up that wave uh, in the original one it's very um, rare that the same place processing happens it's very unusual yeah. yes for, for that to happen yeah yeah absolutely so um, so there we have it it does look as if I've done something odd here but it's the same aspect ratio or is it just the way I'm looking at the screen uh, I think oh, they I are think yes so. yeah good yeah. okay um, okay so I think you know that uh, one thing that uh, the best way to end this session I think would be to say that um, it's really, really important that you live with pictures. Um, and one of the, you know, that making a print is a great idea, but don't, uh, I, it's always a bad idea probably to exhibit it right away. Yes. You know? Live with that print. And maybe over time, you, 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 your own feelings about the place become more reflective and more, uh, and, and more detached. And that detachment can bring with it a wiser bit of, of processing so there. would it be fair to say when you've when you've gone in and you've done your initial processing after a trip like egg um you you put that whole folder to one side and maybe come back to it in in six months or even a year i do believe you've been going through back catalogue recently to to select images and look yeah. at them again anyway yeah i have and and i it's an immensely helpful i must say rather reassuring process because i don't know about you but i quite often when i've i've been out with my camera and working intensely for days and days on end you know, and I, I then start accumulating what I've done. I look at them together and I think, God, that's terrible. Uh, and and you, you think, oh, I'm a useless photographer. And, and then and then bit by bit, over time, as you reflect back, you think, well, oh, that wasn't so bad. Yeah, become too close to them when you're taking them. Yeah, uh, yeah, you do. Yeah. Feel the potential. Well, that, that's, that's great. And uh, next uh, installment, we'll be looking at some of the uh, the layers again in some more detail. Uh, and the tools pass for sharpening um, and print. Sure thing. Thank you very much.